Hey, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, what, uh, that God, each person in this room, Father, I pray that we would open our hearts to what you have to say to us. I pray, Lord, that we would be open, God, to going on a new journey, Father, to uh, perhaps for some of us treading new paths and maybe for some of us revisiting old, but maybe doing it differently this time around. And so God, just speak to each individual in this room in a language that they would understand this morning, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, <coughs> if you've got a Bible there, go to Genesis chapter 12. We'll get straight into it. Genesis chapter 12. You love that verse? Awesome. Genesis chapter 12. I want to speak for a few weeks on... Um, a topic. Now, next week I won't be uh, speaking, by the way. We have. Ready? No? Next week? Two weeks. Okay, in two weeks' time, we've got Brendan preaching. So I will be preaching next week. Um, but in two weeks' time, we've got Brendan. So I'm just, I'm that excited about it. I already, I'm already there nearly. I thought it was next week, but it's the week after. I'll pull myself back a bit and calm down. Uh, so, for the next couple of weeks, and then after that, too, I want to talk to us about the topic of the Holy Spirit. Now, I just want to preface by saying this. When I say the Holy Spirit, how many of you know that we think in words, we think in pictures, not words? How many of you know that? We, we think in pictures, not words. Um, when I teach on evangelism on uh, anywhere, one of the very first things I teach people is if somebody says to you, are you a Christian? Don't say yes, because you don't know what you just confirmed you were. So the starting point is, if someone says, are you a Christian? I say to them, you tell me what a Christian is first, and then I can tell you whether I'm one of them or not. Because it's amazing how many people, when they hear the word Christian, think something, but that's not who we are. But we just say yes, and straight away you've been painted with a brush, and now you're being listened to through a lens and looked at through a set of glasses, and maybe there are walls put up, and anything good you've got to contribute, it's not going to happen because we've been there, done that, and we knew a Christian once, and he was a Fruit Loop. He was a nutcase, he was crazy, he was pushy, he was forceful, he just didn't listen to anybody, his opinion. Was, yeah. And so that's who you are, but you're like, no, I'm not, I'm actually a really nice person. And if you would just drop the guard and listen to me, but you did it to yourself because you walked straight into the trap and you said yes without actually knowing what you were saying yes to. Because people think in pictures. Uh, it's the same when people say uh, uh, church. Do you go, uh, when, when you say the word church, people have a picture, yeah? They have a picture of what it is. And maybe when they were kids, they were brought up in a church where you stood up and sat down when you were told to and faced left when you were told to and turned to page, this page when you were told to. And, and nothing wrong with that, but maybe that was it. And there was a lady up there with a pipe organ. Every time she hit the keys, dust came out of the back of the organ. And, uh, you know, maybe when the preacher preached, um, there was just kind of monotone. There was no excitement, no life. Um, who knows, but, but that could be it. I remember being on a plane once going to Townsville and talking to these young girls and they couldn't believe that I was a pastor because I, I had some dye in my hair. It's a long story, don't want to go there, but my hair was funky back then with tints in it. And they couldn't believe that a pastor could have tint in his hair. Like you don't, Pastors don't look cool and I look cool. Then I began to tell them about the church we were a part of at the time and it had, uh, I said, look, we've got musicians playing uh, on Sunday morning for God and the rest of the week they're playing in bars and pubs and clubs because they're all professional musos and, and she's just freaking out. And then she tells me her story. She was brought up in church. She was, she was 18 years of, <coughs> 19, sorry, when I spoke to her on the plane heading back to Townsville. And she told me that she stopped going to church because she was brought up in a church that was very up, down, up, down. There was kind of, her, the way she described it, no life. In that gathering, it was just function and form and zero life of God. And so as soon as she could, she checked out of it and wasn't going anymore. And when I explained to her about our, the church we were a part of at the time, and she saw me, this funky looking, that was her term, not mine, you're the funkiest pastor I've ever seen. That's what she said to me. So I was, she saw a funky looking pastor, and she heard about professional musicians and a guitarist playing rock music and stuff. It just blew her mind. And when she got off the plane, she actually said to me, do you think that there'd be a church like that here in Townsville? Because I'd probably go back to one like that. I said, I'm sure there would be plenty of them here. So go and explore and find. I never saw her again and I, I pray and hope that she found herself in a place. But the point is when you say things, people have pictures. When you say the word God, people have a picture. Maybe it's, it's their religion. When you say God, somebody thinks Allah. Maybe somebody thinks Ganesh. 
Maybe somebody thinks Vishnu. Maybe somebody thinks Buddha. But you, we just use the word God. <coughs> and people have a picture. And then everything you say gets kind of filtered through that lens and that picture and so on. Well, I'm very, very aware as I begin to talk about the Holy Spirit that you've probably got a picture. We've probably got a picture. And so I want to just ease my way into this today and start by acknowledging some of the pictures that you may have very quickly. There are some people probably sitting here and maybe you're going, oh yeah, it's about time. 30 years ago, the Holy Spirit was really moving in the church and people were falling over and barking like dogs and clucking like chickens and I've been waiting 30 years for a pastor to bring it back. So come on, let's get on with it. Let's bring back the good old days. Well, I don't want to disappoint you, but just because God was doing something 30 years ago, I'm not saying that we're going to pluck that back and reach into the past and make it all happen again. If it was God back then who made it happen, then it's got to be God if it's going to happen again. Amen? It's not us. I am not the Holy Spirit. Repeat after me, everyone in this room. I am not the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I want you to actually believe that. Believe it. I don't know how many times I've had people try to push me over when they pray for me. Like God can't put me on my backside if he wants to. If God wants to. Hey, the guy created the universe. Come on. He can knock me over. I'm not that strong. You don't have to shove me. And we've all been there and had things like that. So I'm not talking about reaching back and going, hey, let's make all these funky things happen because if stuff like that happens, it must be the Holy Spirit. I do this other little jokey thing that I do with the, 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 when I speak on YWAM schools. And at the start of it, they'll get someone to come up and pray for me. <laughs> and the protocol is two students come up and pray for me before I begin each day's lectures. And they come up and they'll, they'll, they'll ask me, can we lay hands on you and pray? I always say, yeah, you can. And when they touch me, I just go, like this. And everybody laughs. And I just make the point, you know, just because someone didn't fall over doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not present. Just because someone didn't burst out in tongues or a big prophetic utterance doesn't mean the Holy Spirit wasn't present. Okay? So I just want to say that. If you're sitting here thinking, we're going to reach... No, we're not. We're not. We're not. But we are going to look at the Holy Spirit. There's probably another group of people sitting here... <laughs> And you've had those very negative experiences. Anyone had negative experiences with people who claimed it was the Holy Spirit and they claimed that they were spirit-filled and spirit-led and it was just plain weird? Anyone ever had that? Am I, I have. Okay, there's a handful of us. Great. I, wanna, I want you to put your walls down because I'm not talking about manufacturing weirdness. I, I remember when we first moved to Bundaberg and we went, I went to, I just desperately wanted to, uh, we got married and then we moved from, from Brisbane to Bundaberg and I just wanted to get around some Christians. And so I found out about this uh, Christian men's gathering that was meeting in a park out in the middle of nowhere. I should have known straight away, really. A bunch of Christian men meeting in a park in the middle of the night. I, I should have known it was not going to be good. Nothing good ever comes of that. But I thought I'll go to it anyway because someone recommended it. So here I am. I find myself driving through this, this bush track and I pull up and here's these men and this meeting starts and I don't remember anything about the meeting because I was so traumatized. All I remember is at the end, the guy said, come forward, <coughs> um, and, um, pointed me out, said, we want to pray for you because I was the newbie. So I was like fresh meat. So they dragged me up to the middle of these eight, I'll call them men, and, and they gathered around me. It was like a scene out of Lord of the Rings, you know, where the guys with the cloaks and they're all gathered around. With this, that sort of felt like I'm like, ah. and they start praying for me. And as they're praying for me, there's all the bells and whistles happening around me and stuff. And I'm not saying it was God. I'm not saying it wasn't God. All I know is what was going on in my heart and what happened to me. And so then they start praying. Then a guy goes to me, do you pray in tongues, brother? And look, let me preface by saying, not everybody has that gift. And I don't believe that if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're not filled with the Spirit. That's a load of baloney. I, I believe I can show you doctrinally why that is not true. Amen? So if you're sitting here again and you're thinking, oh, I don't speak in tongues. I'm... No, no, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. We make such a big deal over what Paul said is the least of the gifts. Let's, let's push that to the side. But they said to me, do you speak in tongues? I said, well, yeah, I do. And they said, well, come on, pray in tongues, brother. So I start praying under my breath very softly because it's just me communicating in, in the language gift God gave me to God. So I'm, and and, and the, the guy that was leading the meeting starts leaning into me going, what was that? What was that? Come on, louder, I can't hear you. 
So very respectfully, I looked up and said, well, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking to you. I'm, I'm actually talking to God. And then he goes, really? You think God can hear that? And then they all started laughing at me. <laughs> and I'm standing there going, are you serious? Fair, fair dinkum. And this was advertised as a spirit-filled men's meeting. If it was a spirit, it certainly wasn't the spirit I went there for. So we've all had kind of weird encounters with uh, scenarios and places and things like that. I want you to put your defenses down. See, I don't believe that when the Holy Spirit turns up or when the Holy Spirit operates, I don't believe that Holy Spirit equals weirdness. I don't believe the weirder it is, the more it must be the Holy Spirit. And again, this is why I want to spend a few weeks, let's, let's pull out of the pages of these ancient documents, let's have a look at what the, the Word of God, what these, these ancient writers actually said about the Holy Spirit. Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misunderstandings. But I also believe this, if we don't do life with the Holy Spirit as Christians, we're like that toy that we bought our child at Christmas but forgot to put the batteries in. Or worse than that, we're like the parents that bought the toy for the children that had the batteries, but when the child said there's, there, there's no batteries in it, we agreed with them. They said, yeah, there's not. When their batteries are actually included in that particular toy. See, I've, I've said it before, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is the batteries included. Amen? If you have truly repented and truly turned in faith to God the Father. This is what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, that if you've truly repented and you've truly turned in, in faith towards God, he said that this promise of the Holy Spirit that you see poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit falls, gets everyone's attention, Peter preaches, and he says to the crowd, what you're seeing here, he said, if you repent and have faith, he said, this promise of what they've received that Joel prophesied about, the promise that they've received, this promise is for you and your children and your grandchildren as far off as many as would believe. So if you have truly repented and handed your life over to God, be assured right now, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a biblical guarantee. You are filled with the Spirit. You might not feel like it. You might not think it. But according to the guys that were there, the very first day that the Spirit was poured out upon all flesh, the first person to ever talk about it when it happened was a guy called Peter. And according to Peter, if you have truly repented and turned in faith to God, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Genesis chapter 12. I want to have a look at this journey that Abraham goes on way, way back in the beginning. How many of you know that Many times in the New Testament, Abraham is referred to as like a father of faith, a hero of faith, an example of faith. Abraham is used countless times as a picture, uh, even though it's Genesis 12, it's way back in the beginning. Yet there's something about this man's journey that is incredibly applicable to New Testament Christianity. Because so often they go back and refer to Abraham's faith and the great things that Abraham did as an example of faith as a New Testament or New Covenant believer, which is you and me, somebody filled with the Spirit. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, it says this. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Abram got up and went. Um, just to give you a bit of context, at this point in time, when this voice speaks to Abram, Abram is not what we would call a Christian. Abram and his descendants and his family. Uh, Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, Joshua recalls it. It says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So when this voice comes to Abram, Abram is not serving Yahweh, the, the, the true God. Abram is being brought up serving another God. As a matter of fact, they, they kind of believe historians and archaeologists and, and theologians believe that, that what they worshipped there was the moon God. 
the Chaldeans worshipped the God of the moon and, and so on. And so he was probably a moon worshipper. But this voice speaks to him. God, the creator of the universe, comes to him and says, I want you to leave everything behind and come on a journey with me. I want you to leave what you've got, leave where you are, and come on a journey with me. Now, that is a great picture of faith. That is a great picture of what happened to you and to me the moment that we went from worshipping something other than God to all of a sudden obeying God and starting off on this journey with him. And the first thing that, that God said to him was, you need to leave that which is familiar. You've got to leave what's familiar in order to come with me and let me take you to another place. The first step is to leave behind the familiarity of what you know. Now, anyone that's come to faith, that's exactly what we did. I had a familiarity about life. I knew how it worked. I knew how it operated. I knew, I knew how to get results. I knew what didn't get... I knew all the systems and the things that the world said, this is how life works. I knew all that. But when God came knocking on my door and called to me, he said the same thing to me and the same thing to you that he said to Abraham. Now it's time to leave that which is familiar and come with me on a journey. I'm going to take you somewhere new. I'm going to take you to another place. But we've got to be prepared to let go of that which was familiar in order to do that. Now, here's the thing with us human beings. Many of us have done this. We've left that which was familiar, and we began on a journey. But as soon as we got a little bit down the track of the journey, what did we do? We started pulling together all these bits and pieces of information so that we now had a new sense of familiar. So now we go from knowing exactly how life operates without God or thinking we do and not getting the most out of life. We come over here, we start this journey with God. We get a little bit of knowledge, a couple of Bible readings, maybe a training course. And before you know it, we've got a whole new set of familiar. And now we think we know how we do life with God. We've gone from thinking we could do life without God, which was wrong, to thinking we can systematize how we do life with God. And guess what? It's equally as wrong. Because we were never ever created to live out of some kind of system. We were never created to live out of a rule book. How many people approach this as a rule book? If I can just go through this book, I can find out all the do's that I'm meant to do and all the don'ts that I'm not meant to, and I'll just make sure if my do's of the do's outweigh the don't doing of the don'ts, then life can... But it just never works like that. And how many people get down the track of their Christianity? And here's what's interesting. When you came to faith, you probably knew nothing. You probably knew nothing. You didn't have a lot of information. You didn't know a great deal of stuff. You left behind a world where you thought you knew everything and you started on a journey with God. But then as we go on that journey, so many of us end up in the same place that we left and that is we end up living in a place where we're just living out of that which is now familiar. Only it's now Christian familiarity. And when we land in that place, guess what? Many of us, we feel almost as dead and as dry in that place as we did back here before we started the journey. We feel just as helpless, just as hopeless, just as powerless, just as useless over here as we did before we started on the journey. We were never called to live by a rule book. Think about it. God knows that we are silly human beings and that rules don't work. How many of you know that? Rules don't work. I mean, in the beginning, God says you can have one trillion do's and there's one don't. You can do anything, eat anything, go anywhere, have anything, be whatever. Don't touch the one tree over here. And we went, awesome, let's touch the tree. We couldn't obey one rule, one rule. That's all we had in the beginning. People say God's about rules. Well, go back to the beginning. He wasn't about rules in the beginning. There was one rule and we still blew it. I'm wondering what the angels were thinking when God goes down to the mountain and Moses is up there and God goes, get a piece of wood, a piece of timber, of stone and a chisel. I'm going to give you 10 rules and the angels are going, no, don't do it, God. 
Don't you remember? You gave them one and they blew it. What do you think they're going to do with ten of them? We weren't made to live and be controlled by rules. We were made to live out of relationship. We were made to walk with God, not just know stuff about God. We were, we were made to, to wake up each day and go, before my feet hit the ground, I know that there's somebody with me today. I know that the batteries are included. I know that there's power beyond my natural self with me right now today. I know there's wisdom beyond my natural understanding with me right now today. I know that there's insight beyond my natural understanding with me right here today now. And we're meant to go through each day with that understanding and that acknowledgement. The other day, I, I, I went to visit Dell in hospital. Dell's in hospital. And um, the other day, I got in the car and I, I drove towards Dell. Now, I just live around the corner from here. I'm not too far from, you know, my GPS said it was 7.8 kilometres or something like that to get to, excuse me, St. Vincent's Hospital. My, I didn't have my glasses on, could have been 17.8, but anyway, uh, it was something like that. So what I did is, being the smart man I am, <coughs> and I emphasise the word man for this illustration because you ladies will probably go, oh, duh. So what happened was I punched in St. Vincent's Hospital in my GPS, and I come out my driveway, come down Pignat, around, I get to Holland Street. Now, when I get to Holland Street, this beautiful angelic voice speaks at me from the GPS, on, take the first right on Holland Street which would take me up to... And so what do you think I did? I took the first left. I turned left on Holland Street. And then as I turned left, I heard that familiar, after about five seconds, you hear that bing. Yeah, anyone get that when it recalibrates? It goes bing. I, I often wonder what's going on in the little voice's head before the ping. You know, you idiot. <laughs> bing. Hang on, pull myself together. At the next intersection, stupid, turn right. So I get to Oliver Avenue and it says that Oliver Avenue, turn right, so I did. And then I'm going down Oliver Avenue, then at Kadena Street, I, I get this, uh, at, at, at the bottom of the hill at Kadena Street, turn right. So I get to Kadena Street and guess what I did? I didn't turn right, I kept going straight along Oliver Avenue. I just kept on going. And then again, five seconds later, I get that familiar bing. It's like, take a breath, take a breath, Siri. Whew, okay, just go with it, go with it. This guy's a clown, go with it, go with it. <laughs> You've dealt with the bigger ones, just go with it. And so I end up going all the way down there and I end up getting... But, but here's the thing, do you know why I ignored that voice each time and why I went the way I went? Because it was familiar. Every time I go into town, I have a routine. This is what I do. I go out, pick that place, I turn left, I come down Holland, I get to Oliver, I turn right, I go Oliver Avenue all the way to the end of Rouse Road, I hit the little roundabout, I turn right, and it links me up with Balna Road. Why do I go that way? I don't know, I just do. It's what I do there. Is it the quickest? Probably not. Is it the safest? I don't know. Does the GPS think it's the best way to go? No, she doesn't. But I go that way, why? Because that's what I do. Why? Because it's what I've always done for two years since we bought our house. I go that way to get into town and I just keep doing it. And even when a higher power tries to tell me something other than that, I'll listen to it, go, thank you, but I'm still going to do what I want to do because it's familiar. And how many of us are like that in our Christian experience? We just keep going through the motions and doing the same thing over and over because we think that the power and the joy and the passion and the enthusiasm of the Christian life is found in obeying some rules when it's not. It's found in walking daily with a person. It's found in listening to that voice that wants to speak, that wants to guide, that wants to lead, that wants to teach, that wants to give us wisdom we don't have, insight we don't have, and release power through us that we don't have in our own natural self. But we get stuck in the familiarity of how we've always done things. Why? Because that's just the way that we've done them. And we wonder why we find ourselves maybe sitting here today going, you know what, I'm here today just because it's familiar. It's what I do. I'm going to pick up my Bible maybe once or twice this week. It's just, it's what you do. It's the habit. It's familiar. I'm not against habit, by the way. I think if you're going to have habits, read your Bible, pray and go to church. They're three of the best habits you could ever have in your life. So I'm not against habits. 
What I'm saying now is if your whole Christian experience is just simply rote habit, you're missing the point of what Jesus has for us. Jesus said in, 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 in John 14, verse 12, Jesus said this, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, speaking to his followers, <coughs> he said, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. And then he goes on and explains why will people like you and me be audacious enough to think that we could do the same kinds of stuff that Jesus did. Jesus did. And here's what he says. He says, because I go to my Father. Because I go to my Father. What was the significance of Jesus going to the Father? Well, Jesus told us that when he went to the Father, he was going to do something. John 16, verse 5 to 7. He says to his disciples, now, by the way, wouldn't it have been cool to be a disciple? Wouldn't it have been cool to actually, well, can you imagine if Jesus Christ himself was here this morning preaching to you? Do you reckon you'd come to church? Do you reckon you'd want to be here every week when he picked up a microphone and spoke? Hey, do you reckon if he said, I'm going downtown to, to walk the streets and just to do some evangelism, do you reckon you'd join his team and go with him? If he said, I'm going to the hospital, we're just going to pray for the sick and see what happens, do you reckon you'd go with him? I reckon you would. And I reckon I would too. So here's Jesus saying to these guys, uh, about to have a conversation with them, he says, but now I go away to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? Now remember, Jesus has just said to them, you're going to be able to do greater works than, than me. You're going to do the same things I did, even greater, because I'm going away. Now he's expanding on that. He goes, I'm, now, I'm about, now it's time for me to actually go away. But he says, but none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. In other words, Jesus has said to them, I'm about to go. And they go, oh, this is going to suck. The party's over. What's going to happen now that Jesus ain't here? How's this going to play out? Because Jesus isn't going to be here with us. And Jesus, it's almost, I can sense the frustration in him going, I've just told you I'm going away, yet none of you even ask him, where am I going? I just told you two chapters back as well, when I go away, you're going to be able to do greater things because I go away. Now I'm about to, and you're still not even asking me, where am I going? Forget it. I'm just going to tell you. And he does. Straight over the top, and he says this. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. You're not going to ask me, I'm just going to tell you. It is to your advantage that I go away. And there is prick up. What? How could it be any better than this? And he says, here's how. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Who's the helper that he's talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, it's better for you if I be not here in the flesh. It's best for you if my spirit comes and indwells you. And you think the life that you have walking alongside of me, watching me do stuff is exciting. Wait till that spirit gets in you and you start doing that stuff yourself. That's when the Christian life comes alive. That's when we find our faith being built. That's when we find each day becoming an exciting journey. It doesn't mean that we don't have the mundanity of life. Everybody has to eat meals. Everybody has to cook food. Everybody has to wash their clothes. Everybody goes to the toilet. Everybody has a sleep. Everybody gets tired. Everybody goes to work. Everybody goes to school. But in the midst of that, there's a sense of excitement in which God says, I've filled you with my spirit. And the things that I want to do, now instead of one Jesus in one location at one time now there are millions of little jesuses running all around the community filled with the same power the same spirit that jesus had upon himself where once upon a time jesus said i only do that which i hear the father doing but the other thing is i can only do it right here where i am physically geographically right now as well well now the father goes well now i've got jesus's everywhere who can do what the father tells them to do who can do what i'm prompting them to do 
what I'm telling them to do. And when we start operating out of our Christianity with communion and union with the Holy Spirit, that's where the life of our faith is found. It's not found in religion. It's not found in ritual. It's not found in just going through motions. It's found in a connection with a life-giving spirit that Jesus said, I have to go because I have to send this spirit. It's so important for you as a member of this thing that I'm going to create called the church. It's so important and imperative that every one of you have this spirit in you for the success of the church, for the building of the kingdom. You can't do it without my spirit. You can't do it without my spirit. That's where the life of the party begins. That's where Christianity... Young people, if you're a young person here, uh, if you're a young person here, let me just say one thing to you. Christianity is not about rules and regulations. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about being connected to God, knowing that God's never going to tell me to do anything that is outside the boundaries of his word and character anyway. He's not going to tell me to leave my wife. He's not going to tell me to cheat on a friend. He's not going to tell me to cheat on an exam. He's not going to tell me not to pay taxes. He's not going to, he's not going to tell me to break the law. He's not going to do that. Whatever he calls me to do is going to be in line with the kingdom values of the kingdom. It's going to be in line with what God wants to do on planet Earth. It's going to be in line with making you the person he wants you to become and achieving the things that he wants you to achieve. I see so many young people that, that want to go and explore. I, 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 was, I was told about a, 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 a person just this week, young person, who's, who's, who's making the decision, brought up in a, in, a, in a faith Christian family and has made the decision, I'm going to go away and I want to go and explore other religions. And when they were pressed on why, why would you want to explore other religions? Well, I don't want to be in a religion where I'm controlled. That, that was her perspective, where I have to read Bibles and I have to do, have to, have to. And, and, and when I heard the story, I thought, oh, wow. I wonder if this person's ever had it explained to them that Jesus didn't say, I can't wait to get to heaven because I'm going to send you down a book. I can't wait. I've got to, it's more better for you if I go because when I go, the book will come. When I go, the new set of rules will come. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to send my spirit to live on the inside of you, to empower you. I'm going to give you the batteries. And we have the batteries included. The Christian life is meant to be a life. It's a journey just like Abram went on. It's a journey. It's a journey of faith. It's a constant step out. And I think the day we get to the place where we feel like we've worked it out, I think we need to go back to God. You go, God, remind me of your Holy Spirit. God, remind me of the, the person that walks with me, the person that lives in me, the person that dwells with me. The minute we think we've figured out the Christian life, we're probably getting ourselves slightly off track. God wants to walk through us. He wants to talk through us. He wants to teach us. He wants to guide us. And Jesus made it very clear that when I depart from here, that it's going to be the Holy Spirit that does that. You know, a, a good sign for a believer if, if you've lost sight of the reality of the Holy Spirit in your life is you begin to lose your passion and your joy for God. Da David said something interesting in Psalm 51, verse 11 and 12. This is after David had, had, had sinned. He'd been busted, mucking around with Bathsheba, a woman that wasn't, uh, that wasn't his. And, and in Psalm 51... As a response to that, David says this. He says, Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In the Old Testament, the Spirit used to come down and God would take the Holy Spirit away. Uh, different now. New Covenant, New Testament, new way of doing things. But David was saying, Please don't take your Holy Spirit off me. I know what it's like to live with the presence of your Holy Spirit and I don't want to live without it again. So don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And in the same breath, he says, uh, Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. And you know one thing I've noticed with people uh, within the church, Christians, when they start losing their joy, 
when they start losing their passion, when they start losing their enthusiasm for the things of God. See, my enthusiasm for prayer comes out of my relationship with him. My enthusiasm for, to get into this word comes out of my daily relationship with him. It comes out of the passion and the stuff that the Holy Spirit puts in me. That's where that all comes from. When we start to lose our hunger for spiritual things, when we start to lose the joy of fellowship, the joy of prayer, the joy of getting into the word of God, when we start losing the enthusiasm and focus on, 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 on those kinds of things that we know build into our life, I reckon it's a very good sign that we've started to take our eyes off the daily presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we're becoming, I I, I guess to a degree, we're starting to become more religious than we are relationship-oriented. We become more religious than we do relationship-oriented when that joy starts to disappear. Uh, I'll get the the, the band back up. I want to finish with that Find Me song again. John chapter 20. There's an interesting interaction between Mary and Jesus. Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has been crucified. And he's been buried three days. And after three days, we all know the glorious story, the reason why we're here. He's resurrected from the dead. Jesus appears. And Mary spots Jesus. And as you would imagine any of us would do, she runs up to him and she grabs him. The resurrected Jesus. She grabs him. And she hugs him. And she doesn't want to let him go because he, he was crucified, he was buried, and, and, and now he's back. I ain't letting you go. And she grabs a hold of him. And in John 20, verse 17, Jesus says this to her. He says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Again, what's the importance of the ascension to the Father? He had to get there to send His Spirit. It's like He's saying to Mary, hey, don't cling to me, Mary. Let, 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 let me put it in, a, in simple terms, without sounding blasphemous. The Father had His moment in the Son. Garden of Eden, He's walking the earth with Adam and Eve. Right through the Old Covenant, we see the Father... Then Jesus comes into the world and it's like all of a sudden the Father sits down and then Jesus gets his moment to shine. And for 33 years he walked the earth. For three years he taught and he ministered and he healed and did all the stuff that he did. And then after 33 years Jesus was crucified. And then he ascends. And then he sends the Spirit to the earth. And now it's the Holy Spirit's time to shine. Yet how neglected is the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? How real is the Holy Spirit to us? Yet it's the Holy Spirit's time to shine down here on planet Earth through people like you and me. It's the Holy Spirit's time to do something. The Father did an amazing job when He was here, but it's very clear the Bible teaches us that He's now seated on a throne in heaven. Jesus did an amazing thing while he was down here. He did his bit. But now the Word of God teaches that he's seated at the right hand of the Father now. The whole thing will reverse eventually because one day Jesus will come back and he'll put his feet down here again. And then he'll take all of us back to the Father. It's like this cycle. But we live in a time right now where the Holy Spirit has been poured out. Joel prophesied that the Holy Spirit will eventually be poured out on all flesh all flesh. You'll have dreams, visions, you'll have wisdom, insight, miracle working power. It's going to happen. And then the book of Acts chapter 2, it happened. It happened. It happened. But then as time's kind of gone on, I wonder whether we've drifted away from that very, very simple truth. That's not about how much I know. It's not about my skill set. It's not about, you see, see, so many of us are waiting for something else to happen in our life. We're waiting for something else to happen. If I could just get a new this, then my Christian life would come alive. If I could just, I'll go to another church. Because if I go to another church, my Christian life will come alive. I'll just join another small group. My Christian life will come alive. Maybe I'll just buy a new house. My Christian life will come alive. I'll get a new job. My Christian life will come alive. I'll, I'll... Get a new partner, my Christian life will come alive. 
When the kids leave home, my Christian life will come alive. We're all kind of waiting for something else to happen. Not you, darling. We're all waiting for something else to happen. But there on the day of Pentecost, something happened that was prophesied years before. That Jesus, our Lord and Saviour himself, said it's better. This is better for you than if I be walking with you in person. And I look around the church and I wonder, do we believe that? Do we actually believe that? We have the explanation of it, but do we live in the experience of it? Because that's where the life of Christianity is found.